Welcome to Cinema of Meaning, a podcast from myself, Thomas Flight, and my fellow video essayist, Tom Vanderlinden, from the YouTube channel Like Stories of Old, where we discuss cinema and try to explore the depths that it has to offer. This week, we're talking about the Japanese classic by director Masaki Kobayashi, Harakiri from 1962. This movie was a recommendation to us from our very first patron. Mm -hmm. If you would like to join our Patreon community, you can go to patreon.com slash cinema of meaning where you can get access to our bonus episodes and our discord and you get to find out what we're going to be talking about a week ahead so you can watch along with us and all that kind of stuff. So check that out if you want to become a patron. But Tom, this was my first time watching this movie. I had heard a lot about it. It's been on my list for a long time. You had seen it before. Mm -hmm. It's it's a great film. It's, I think, hailed as one of the best Japanese films of all time. What was your impression of it before this? And did you find anything new here revisiting it? It's one of those movies that I'd seen a long time ago when I was just starting out exploring movies and diving into like Japanese and other foreign films. And I quickly became a big fan of Kobayashi's work. He's probably my favorite Japanese directors next to uh, Akira Kurosawa, of course. So yeah, I was really glad that our very first patron came in with those. He had multiple recommendations, but uh, one of which was Harakiri, which I was really glad to hear because then I had this excuse to go watch it again, which I'd been meaning to do anyways. Kobayashi is somewhat underappreciated, I think, especially next to Kurosawa, who has, has a much wider acclaim. Not to say that he's that's undeserved. He definitely deserves all the claim he has, but uh, Kobayashi has a very slightly different touch to the way he approaches movies. Like I remember especially watching uh, The Human Condition, which is this trilogy of war movies, basically, with the same actor as uh, Haruki or the same main actor. Uh, but it's basically if you've seen the Russian movie Come and See and you thought like, oh, for some reason you want more of that or you wish <laughs> that would be expanded into a the Lord of the Rings sized trilogy, then the human condition is the one to watch. And But the reason I talk about it is because that series of movies really showed I think at least where Kobayashi's interests lie. He's very interested in power structures and how they lead to violence, even um, um, like among like, not necessarily evil men, but it, it kind of shows how systems can facilitate men who are not necessarily evil, but they become cruel as uh, yeah. like that system allows it and how no. then good people kind of suffer in that process. And so in Harakiri, you kind of have the same dynamics, I think, where it almost feels like a, a revisionist Western, but then for the Eastern samurai culture, where it's not just displaying this, the kind of traits that that culture has, but it's also yeah. kind of critically assessing it and kind of uncovering its shortcomings or its flaws or its darker side, if you will. And so, yeah, that's something that really fascinated me about this movie and again, about Kobayashi's work as a whole. And so, yeah, maybe we should do a short plot recap for those who may not have seen it yet or might be interested in checking it out before we dive into spoilers. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, I, uh, my pitch for this would be beautiful black and white cinematography. There's an amazing command of the form, hmm. the way the movie moves between these like really minimalist and intentional precise setups well it's all precise but these very these very like locked down unmoving shots with held kind of composition and then moves into this more these zooms and these pans and stuff is done with a lot of thematic purpose in a really interesting way i might talk about that more once we get into the actual themes but i love all of that a really great central performance and the way in which the structure of this movie unfolds is very fascinating. I really like how it kind of leads you through the narrative in a way that sets up the stakes. It sets the stakes really high. It's essentially a series of interlocking stories, which reminded me a lot of a Wes Anderson film, although this came first. Hmm. Wes Anderson is stealing his 
stuff from this probably, but it opens with a storybook and then you have a guy who comes in and then he's being told a story and then he tells a story. It's like all these things, but mm-hmm. it's formatted in such a way that the stakes for those stories are really high and you're engaged and interested the whole time. And all of that is alongside this sort of moral and ethical examination of tradition, but in a way where how the plot proceeds is directly connected to those things is directly connected to the the thema- what it's doing thematically so you get into this place where the actions that the characters are going to take or the decisions that they're going to make is directly informed by sort of the moral dilemma that they're placed within by the characters or that that Kobayashi is examining all of that is like brilliant and great so if you haven't watched it definitely definitely check it out we're going to talk about all of that so do you want to do you want to give maybe a little bit of an overview of what that setup is and and kind of what's happening at least in the first half of this movie uh yeah so as you said it kind of opens with you know, you'd almost forget it but it opens with actually someone some unknown narrator who opens this history book and begins narrating the actual story in which you basically have this sort of samurai clan or school or place where it's peacetime now so there's a lot of samurai who are out of work or they've their masters have kind of gone bankrupt leaving them out in the streets and so there's been a kind of like a stream of samurai that come to places like that to commit harakiri or uh, which is this ritual form of suicide that lets a samurai who's been you know who's at its wit's end lets him uh, die with honor basically and so we have this narrator he introduces us to the story in which this samurai comes in claiming he wants to use that place for his own harakiri and then as he goes in he learns about the story of a different samurai who came in not too long before him and there's this really tragic story about how he was he was so poor that he had to sell his swords and he basically had like bamboo swords instead as he was uh, apparently committed to the harakiri he they kind of got a sense that he wasn't going gonna go through with it and so they ended up uh, because it's their tradition it's the way of honor so they kind of forced him to commit harakiri and they made him use his own bamboo swords which yeah are not sharp at all they don't cut anything so this was this really cruel and kind of vile act and we then kind of cut back to the the other samurai the first one that came in or at least the, the first that came in in the story, as far as we know. And you get the sense that the way they present the previous samurai that came in, he kind of gave this speech about having no other recourse, and so he ha- wanted to go in there and use their facility, basically. And then we have the second samurai who goes in and he uses the exact same phrasing to right. for his own plight. So you get the sense like, okay, there's something is going on here, and this samurai knows more than he's letting on, and... You quickly learn, without even getting into spoilers, that he is indeed an acquaintance of the previous samurai who was forced to commit harakiri in this kind of cruel way. And yeah, from there, the story kind of unfolds. We get more flashbacks as he now tells his side of the story from uh, about how he got to know him and how he got to the point where he is now. And want to jump straight into spoilers or... Yeah, I think I think we can go ahead and get into it. One thing in that setup that I'll mention it that mm. that I think is important is the reason this I don't know what you would call it this community of samurai, uh, mm. the house or the clan that these samurai are coming to. The reason they force the first samurai, their justification for forcing the first samurai to go through with this act, even though he's like very hesitant and he's kind of demanding, he's asking for a few days to go and make some arrangements and then come back but they they force him into this and they do it in this cruel way their motivation for doing that is there's been this tradition of these ronin these samurai at the end of their they're kind of out of employment they're wandering around they're poor and destitute they will come to these clans and ask to do the harakiri there then there was this tradition because it was a pain for the the clans to facilitate the whole ceremony and have to deal with all of it. They were just giving the samurai money to go away and not Mm. bother them, basically. Yeah. And so there was this question of honor of like, you're coming here. 
they were suspicious of the first samurai. Mm -hmm. You're coming here doing this, not really with the intention of killing yourself, but just as a ploy for money. And that's seen as this like disgraceful, dishonorable thing. And so they're kind of making a point by forcing him to, yeah. to go through with it instead of paying, paying him to go away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that more generally, they kind of represent this stubborn attachment to the old ways that have clearly or that are clearly dying out in the world beyond their own little school. So yeah, or one of the um, clan members, he explains how uh, traditionally the harakiri is um, done with a second person. And so uh, what the first, the one who does the harakiri, he sits down and he plunges his sword basically in his abdomen and then cuts it sideways and then once more upwards. And then as the uh, like the cuts and everything spill out, that's when the second person uh, decapitates him for like a like an honorable death in that sense. Or, you know, the samurai has proven he's gone through with it. And then the second one, that's the kind of the reward you get, I guess, for doing the for, for performing the act. Um, but he explains how in the recent years that tradition had kind of softened where it became more ceremonial where instead of samurai having to actually stab themselves they would just be they would perform the ceremony up until the moment where the samurai reaches for the sword or not even there wouldn't even be a sword and then he would get decapitated so it would yeah would have been much more mild and softened in their perception so they also make a point of sticking to the old traditions instead of going with what has already been the more in, in their perspective, like the more modern way of doing it. So that's I, I, that's also kind of sets up their the, the nature of their villainy, I guess. They kind of represent this kind of like, not ignorant, but like this insistent clinging to old principles without really considering what those principles were meant to represent in the first place. Yeah, And so yeah. you can see the cruelty that kind of follows out of that, just the, the baseless assumption and continuation of old traditions without really understanding what was at the core principles or just like uh, without even considering if there's any real moral value to them anyway. Right. Uh, that's also a point that comes back later with the whole question of the first samurai, his name was Chichiwa Motomi. Yeah. So there's, there's this whole question of him having sold his swords yes. to basically feed his wife and child, which uh, for the samurai is this great act of disgrace or dishonor because as they continuously state like a samurai sword that's the warrior's soul you yeah. know that's not something you give away but and i like how it's questioned at the end then also where uh maybe skipping ahead a little bit here but uh when the main character the second samurai that comes in Sukumo, he really begins to question okay why why did i cling to this sword for so long i could have done some good with it like i could have sold it was it really a disgrace that he sold his sword and replaced it with a bamboo version like a cheap knockoff or was he actually doing the more honorable thing or the more th the thing that's more in spirit with what the samurai would represent you know protect their families or whatever j the innocent in general by whatever means necessary but so yeah that, that's something i really like that's the kind of questions that are posed in this story yeah to finish up the, the kind of plot summary uh so it's revealed that Tsugumo, the second samurai that comes in, is the father-in-law of the samurai that was forced to do the harakiri in the kind of brutalist way. He kind of knew him from a young age and he had a daughter and he wanted, uh, eventually asked Chichawa to wed his daughter and they kind of became this family. They had a child together, but then the child fell ill, followed by the wife or his daughter. And that kind of led Chichawa in this act of desperation to go to that samurai school basically where yeah the same place and so it wasn't actually clear to me if he really wanted to do harakiri or that he was trying to get the money as all the other samurai was doing i my read on it is that he he did always intend because he's very clear from the beginning he's like there they several places because mm -hmm. the whole reason he he shows up at the beginning of the movie they tell the head samurai at the at the clan that they're coming to mm -hmm. who is this real hard ass about tradition basically he the whole reason he tells the the story of what they forced this other guy to do is because they're suspicious of Sugumo yeah when he comes yeah. in 
And he keeps insisting like, no, I, I will actually go through with the Harakiri. If there's any question of that, you know, don't worry about that. I think he does it at the very end. I think mm -hmm. he kind of proves that he would be willing to, which is part of the interesting sort of almost Cohen-like structure scenario that this movie is setting up. But he definitely also has ulterior motives, which we find out then that he's already fought with three of the samurai who were responsible, mm, yeah. who showed up and delivered the body of Motomi to he and he and his daughter. He already fought with them and kind of defeated them, mm -hmm. disgraced them in, in yeah. swordplay, that kind of thing. So he shows up to do the Harakiri and definitely has ulterior motives. But I think the tricky thing is he also is sort of genuine in his intention, which kind of sets up the scenario where the he really, truly disgraces this clan, kind of mm -hmm. showing them up as being as both kind of breaking down their adher strict adherence to tradition as this facade and then also mm -hmm. being more adherent to that himself. Yeah. I'm not sure if there was some misunderstanding there, but you were talking about Tsugumo's character, right? And whether or not, or what his true ma motivations were for going into. Yes. You were saying, so were you, you were saying you weren't sure if I was originally unsure about the, the other character, the one... Chijiwa Modami. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. Yes, I would agree there that I'm not sure what his intentions were either. Yeah. I, I think he was probably hoping to get the money, but then obviously he did go through with it. He was going to be killed. He tried to run away. Either way, yeah. Yes, yeah. So they really did, like, force him into it. Mm -hmm. This episode was brought to you by Mubi a curated streaming service dedicated to elevating cinema from all around the globe. Both Thomas and I have been enjoying Mubi for many years. They feature a new film every day and have an extensive library that is great both for newcomers wanting to explore the riches of cinema, as well as for veteran cinephiles in search for something new. Every film is carefully selected and there's even curated lists to help you navigate them, which I'm personally a big fan of as I like to group and watch films together based on a shared language, director, or a common theme. You can try Mubi for free for 30 days by going to mubi.com slash cinema of meaning or by following the link in the show notes. So be sure to claim your extended free trial and start exploring some good cinema. Yeah, but yeah, speaking of uh, Tsugumo, I think it was clear that he went in with the ulterior motive to kind of not not just take revenge. Like I remember, like I clearly remember the final fight scene, and I remember it being a revenge story. But on the last viewing, it was kind of more nuanced than just I'm gonna take as many down with me as I can. I think it's clear that he did intend to die. At the when he enters, he does say quite explicitly, and I think deliberately, like I have full intention to die here although he doesn't necessarily say i have the full i'm fully committed to harakiri right but yeah to kind of wrap up the plot he as you mentioned i'm, I'm sorry if this is very choppy but the, the plot kind of jumps back and forth and then there's new information and then it reveals something else and yeah it, it's it's hard to do like a recap that flows like fluently and still makes sense but anyways he reveals that he already confronted the three leaders of the clan that who basically were the ones that forced his son-in-law to do the Harakiri. And he, we get these flashbacks where he fought with them, uh, but he didn't kill them. Instead, he basically just took their top knots, which is, yeah. as they also say in the movie, is this really uh, clear sign of disgrace for the samurai. Like they, uh, I think they say, like, oh, it's better for a samurai to be killed in battle than to lose his top knot like that. Yeah. And so, um, because that's also the one other thing, like when he sits down for his harakiri, he requests the presence of one of those leaders uh, to be uh, his second, like the, the one who chops off his head. And then yeah. uh, the one who's uh, present there, he's like, oh no, he, he can't do it, he's fallen ill. And then eventually he says like, oh, well, then I'll have the other guy. And then they're like, oh wait, he's ill too. He's at home, no one wants to see him. And then the third guy, same story. And so that's when they suspect like, oh, something strange is going on here and at first it feels like there's some disappointment on Tsukumo's end like he wants to take revenge on this guy but he's not present because he's ill at home right and then but then when the second guy is also ill and the third one also then you start to wonder oh 
did he do something to them already? Did he poison them or something or whatever? But then he reveals it himself, like he essentially disgraced them. Yeah, that's where the final confrontation kind of begins. Like the last 15 minutes is just him fighting everyone that's left, basically, and uh, eventually dying. Or he does actually do it a, a sort of harakiri at the end. When he's about to get shot, he or they eventually bring in some gunmen or musketeers and they then he quickly does stabs himself and he we hear the gunshots and it is over. But yeah, yeah so for me, speaking to his motivations and overall purpose and kind of his character motivation is that I don't think it was as much revenge as much as he wanted to expose the corruption and also the hypocrisy of the clan because you know they say that when a samurai loses his top knot it's more honorable for them to die but instead all those three leaders that forced those harsh traditions or those harsh principles on his son-in-law instead they didn't enforce them on themselves they're staying at home they're sick they're waiting for their top knots to grow back or whatever and so he kind of wanted to show that even though they're forcing these principles for outward appearances like they're forcing the principles on other people and they're trying to maintain this image of a very principled and traditional school of samurai or clan that they did it's all a facade and that's something yeah. that's been that's a line that's repeated a couple of times like the way of the samurai is just a facade and i'm not sure if he was hoping to kind of flip some of the other members around because in the end it does feel like they all turn against him nevertheless as the final confrontation happens there's a lot of arguments that go back and forth between the leader that's present at that, at that moment and uh, Tsugumo, where you might start to wonder, like, is the everyone else going to be affected by this? How is this going to play out? But yeah, the leader basically just uh, orders his men to attack him, to kill him once he's done with the discussion. And that's kind of what happens then. Yeah. But I think a really critical point that I kind of forgot about the last time is that after the whole thing is said and done, we go back to the the kind of unknown narrator who's writing the history book, and then he kind of explains how the whole thing is basically erased from history. Like he's yeah the leaders who had their top knots cut off, they are forced to commit harakiri, but no one will be told about it. They will be said, or it will be said that they died due to an illness. Uh, same goes for the samurai that died at the hand of Tsugumo, which weren't that many like four of them maybe. The other ones were wounded. They had to be taken care of as best as possible so they could recover and then they'd be fine. But then it, it's really emphasized that within days, like Tsugumo has been forgotten. He's even been kind of treated somewhat fairly. They, the story he's received that he just went there, uh, did the harakiri and did it in an honorable way. And, and then it kind of wraps up with the samurai clan even being commended by this other entity or like higher force or something uh some governing power that for their how much they are praised for their principled ways so yeah, to say yeah. or their virtue or, or whatever so that's the part that this time around really made me question like what was the point of it all like did it did Tsugumo even make a difference did he put a dent into this corrupt system or is it really this more tragic story in which you can fight the system expose it and still have it mean nothing for me it is very tragic but there's also this element where it doesn't mean anything in the history books he's not mm -hmm. affecting real change this is where the movie has this brilliant almost like twist to it there's a sense in which i think kobayashi is almost suggesting Tsugumo did win in the sense that he is the only honorable one to kind of come out of the whole story besides maybe uh also Motomi it does it like it's not mm. really suggesting that he's dishonorable but the suggestion is that the clan is disgraced and and Tsugumo still lives up to this kind of honor even though it's maybe not exactly the Bushido samurai code mm -hmm. honor, but it's a it's a more transcendent kind of sense of honor, even though because they're in power and they can just wipe it over. He kind of forces the leaders to accept this idea that their tradition, their honor is a facade because 
they have to put mm -hmm. up this facade at the end in order to maintain the, the facade, basically. He, he forces their hand in that way. So yeah. there's some kind of meaning found in that, I think, that definitely says something about the way mm -hmm. tradition, overreach of tradition, and these kinds of things work, and the value of adhering to some kind of uh, principle beyond maybe just blind adherence to tradition or something or mm -hmm. that's the most tragic element of the movie maybe is that it mm -hmm. does just kind of end with this like yeah and it it didn't really amount to anything it's kind of a similar yeah. vibe to me as what we get in a hidden life to some extent where it's like not to spoil that movie but franz <laughs> goes to all this extent He's making this huge grand stand on principle. It only means anything ultimately, either if it does in a transcendent immediate sense or in his sense, his story ends up being told decades later by yeah. Terrence Malick and other people. But in the immediate sense, in the immediate years following his life, it's forgotten. It falls mm -hmm. into in, until the letters are recovered. Maybe we'll talk about that. Yeah. I, I won't go into that movie. We'll talk about that <laughs> another time. But that's kind of the same same element mm -hmm. here where, you know, it, this is not a true story, mm -hmm. but the immediate act is forgotten, but it's honored in this sort of other way in which Kobayashi is upholding yeah. it as as being the more honorable thing. Yeah, I, I was going to say that's this sort of meta effect where like no one in the world of the movie knows the truth outside of the samurai school, but we as the audience do. So yeah. there's a sense even indirectly and implicitly that there, the message is carried on or whatever facade there was is to us at least now broken or crumbling down. Yeah. The movie doesn't really make an explicit statement on that, but to what extent the school or the samurai clan itself has been affected by Tsukumu basically exposing the facade so that now all those, everyone he fought in that sequence there, everyone that was witnessed there, they kind of know in their hearts that it's not, that it's all a lie basically, even though right. by all outward appearances, they are still this uh, highly praised, uh, highly revered samurai clan. But yeah. none of them who are were there in that during that day, they now, they now know that this was a lie basically. So there's this kind of seed planted in their hearts maybe that's yeah who knows where or how that's going to develop into or what that's going to develop into but i think if the movie's lacking something i wish there was maybe a little bit of a hint there that there was some kind of you know some kind of some kind of change of heart in at right. maybe at least one of the the guys who were present there but yeah maybe uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure kobayashi might be a little bit more pessimistic in that sense that he tends not to cling to such moments you know yeah. in his other works too he tends to really not just take away your hope but also not give you any false rev resolutions that wouldn't feel true to how real life would unfold so right. he, i think he's more it's not so much that he wants to make you feel bad he wants to, I think he wants to just force you to find the meaning as it happens without having that kind of Hollywood type little right. fling of hope at the end yeah. that clearly and explicitly resolves everything for us, the audience that we know, okay, it wasn't all for nothing, you know, there's like a little sprinkle of hope, but yeah, we have to do without it. <laughs> yeah. One thing I'll say is I was doing some reading about this and it's, I can't comment mm -hmm. too much on this element because I'm not fully up to speed, but I think that's one element where some of the historical and cultural context might help a little bit. Uh, there was something I was reading that was talking about within history, you do know, even as Westerners, we know that the samurai code and order eventually mm -hmm. is going to fall anyway. I think there's more, there's more specific context there that I was reading where even this specific leadership that they were, that this clan would have been under fell like to, after 250 years or something. Mm -hmm. So there's there's an element in which arrogance that they have of this kind of being upheld as a way of life and this permanence of it ultimately does disintegrate in history, which I think adds some context. Sugumo is maybe not a direct player in bringing that about, at least that we see, but there's kind of this larger narrative of it being de deconstructed. And then also there's the element of this movie being kind of more of a direct, using the historical context as more of a direct commentary on things that were happening in in post-war Japan, 
Kobayashi's lifetime. And that, I think, for me there, it's very appropriate to do that kind of maneuver, not really saying whether or not it initiated any kind of real change, because in mm -hmm. a sense, he's commenting on things that he is within himself, processes that are, are still happening at the time that he's telling this story to this audience. There's a sense in which it's like, we don't know if, if the change will come about because it hasn't yet with what he is maybe commenting on. One more thing I, I want to say about that. I think the other aspect of that that I think is very interesting is when you're talking about people's lives like this, who make this very, they take a very principled stand and try to fight back against power or tradition in mm -hmm. a certain way. And they're going to do it regardless of the outcome. They have to kind of commit to this, to the point of death, commit to yeah. to what they believe is right. And they don't know if it's going to make a difference, they, but yet they have to make that commitment mm -hmm. anyway in order to try to accomplish anything. The argument against doing that, again, this goes back to the, it's very similar to A Hidden Life. The philosophical argument that you would make against that is like, well, maybe it would be, maybe it won't amount to anything. So just live your life. Don't try because mm -hmm. you might just die and it, it won't mean anything. But there's this bigger question of like, is it meaningful to do that, to take that stand on a principle for what you think is right, even if it is erased from history? Is Sugumo doing the right thing by trying to fight against what he sees as this injustice, even if he doesn't mm -hmm. change anyone's mind? I think that's a that's a really yeah. heavy but interesting question yeah. that that Kobayashi kind of leaves open by by having his story overwritten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the one thing I'll add to that, which to me makes it slightly different from a character like we see in A Hidden Life, is that in Harakiri, it feels also like Tsugumu is not just making this principled stance for justice, but he's also engaged in some act of atonement almost for himself because he right. kind of laments at the end that he was part of the same system and he still has... You know, he, for example, he still has a samurai sword. Yeah. And so he wonders towards the end, like, okay, what, why did I keep this? Like his daughter was dying, his grandchild was sick and they couldn't afford a doctor. Like, why didn't he sell his sword? Why didn't he do the thing his uh, son-in-law did and was crucified for, basically? Why? For me, that was a real, it almost reminded me of Schindler's List, where you, at the end you have Schind Oscar Schindler kind of, he, he saved a lot of the Jews. And then there's this moment where he, instead of being like happy or grateful about it, he, he gets, has this realization, this very real realization that he could have saved more. Like he grabs like, right. this little pin from his jacket or whatever. And he says like, oh, that's two more or maybe one more. Like I could have saved one more. And there's to me that there's still like a very powerful sense of, humanity there that I feel Harakiri also kind of uh, ventures into kind of that that space where you really start to or the, the movie really wants you to question like okay we have these worlds we have principles we have these social systems but what like at the end of the day what's really the most important like yeah is this just facade or is this like the core of living like what is actually worth striving for what do we what is worth sacrificing during hardship? Like, do we give up these tokens of our stature in life or whatever? Or do we just, is it okay to kind of dishonor or even disgrace ourselves if that means we can do the right thing or, you know, we can protect the people that we care about? Yeah. I think that's what yeah. the movie is saying. Like, if if we are punished for doing so, then maybe that's when the the system doesn't no longer works right. or when the system has turned cruel, when these kind of facades become more important than actual human lives and actual uh, human dignity. I think that's for me was kind of the crux about the final confrontation. Like it, he had to expose that whole system and kind yes. of make us question like, which is more important, which is more real, which uh, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same as justice versus injustice, but more, like, where do we, at what point do, because, because we, a society always has social structures and systems that create status, that create expectations about uh, what is deemed honorable or dishonorable, what is shameful or what is righteous. And 
at one point does a do such principles turn into kind of these empty shells of what they were originally intended to accomplish if that makes sense yeah yeah and at what point do we kind of steer away from them or do we have to let go of certain of those things to kind of reclaim that humanity that was lost in that whole process of them becoming just about themselves basically or just when you have like uh, like a code like at some point maybe the code when it just becomes about upholding that principle instead of just having that as a means to an end to achieve some kind of humane goal and right you know at some point you might want to reconsider yeah yeah that principle and that's kind of the struggle i think that this movie depicts like how do you go about doing that when it's so entrenched and so oppressive in its own self preservation as right. an individual like how do you find the honor in a world where that kind of honors the wrong thing in that sense yeah my wife put it in a really good way while we were watching it she said about the clan what like they were so concerned with honor that they became dishonorable mm -hmm. and i think that's the situation that is not just illustrated here, but that we see with so many systems that try to encode some kind of morality into a set of rules or a system of rules. Yeah. Rituals, practices, that sort of stuff. When those things become disconnected from the actual, from the actual sort of spirit of goodness or love or or whatever that that they came out of in the mm -hmm. first place or that hopefully they were coming out of in the first place that they're trying to encode where people are just following those things blindly but are out of touch with kind of the humanity to begin with yeah exactly then they have to be reconsidered in that sense you know maybe saying sugumo is, is making a stand for a principle is the wrong way of putting it i think he still is in a sense he's he's just kind of making this argument for a principle that would stand higher than even the Bushido code, where you're not holding that as the highest thing. It's saying like, mm -hmm. this code has, this code is flawed because it's not meeting this need in this place anymore. It's causing pain and suffering for these people. And that attention to that suffering and the, the, the human impact of those things is ultimately more important than any one given tradition or something like that. And that's something I think that's mm -hmm. a very relevant story to like every culture and every person yeah, yeah. In, to some degree. I think there's times where everyone will have to evaluate sort of what they're expected to do or what the what society wants of them or what their tradition is up against an individual scenario that it, that comes into conflict with that. Because that's ultimately, I think, part of the part of the the problem with the systems that we build is they're rigid and they are kind of low fidelity. That's in some way the benefit of them because that allows them to be applied very broadly and be easily understood and remembered. And you don't have to do the very difficult work of thinking through the morality of every every individual situation mm -hmm. that you encounter in your life if you just adhere to a moral system or code or or whatever but then inevitably as society changes or as we just encounter these very specific individual situations in our life that maybe we didn't encounter before or that are just really unique mm -hmm. you have to make a more deep personal decision about how those things square up that's that's what Sugumo is is doing here to your point earlier yeah. he's kind of deconstructing the whole thing he's saying this whole thing that even i've been a part of is a facade maybe that's why he was also determined to die himself in that place because he knew like i'm gonna deconstruct it i'm gonna have to be a part of that or at least put some skin in the game literally yeah that's the interesting thing here that almost drives home the shame of of the point like the shame that he's heaping on the clan is he ultimately does mm -hmm. kind of adhere to the code more than they do he takes the top knots he commits harakiri and they're forced into this position of ignoring those things and covering them up yeah that's that's one other thing i was going to say because you talked about kind of these moral systems as sort of easy 
shortcuts almost to day-to-day -day decision making but it's also that you when you have such rituals they kind of they also have this initiatory purpose in some way that it's not just right. that they help you make easier decisions but it's also that they actually bring about morality that wouldn't otherwise be there maybe like that's why we have a lot of these rituals you see it in like religions or even other uh, like right. i don't know sports clubs or something like lesser variants of but it's basically like team building exercises is what it comes down to i think where you have some kind of rite of passage that you go through in order to kind of prove yourself and embody the morality that you're striving for like it there, there's value i guess to these demonstrate or performative acts that demonstrate your seriousness about a moral value and they kind of become uh, you know they, they tend to turn into these rituals or uh, encoded performative acts as you would say it maybe but and that's i think where kind of the, the trouble lies where you have this thing that's initially set up not just to capture morality but also to kind of make it happen to make individuals to carry them over this threshold into a more moralistic way of being and then addressing that when whenever a, a an act like that come becomes disconnected from achieving that goal when it doesn't bring individuals into that moral space but instead just brings them into yeah. this kind of self-repeating loop where it kind of just reaffirms itself instead of the thing the, the moral thing or the humane thing goal that it was going to achieve that's when it becomes problematic but it's also then hard to deconstruct when there is that initial value to it that you know you know it's like with maybe military boot camps you know they it's hard to argue against the fact that they do breed like discipline and some to some extent like some some form of brotherhood but at the same time you can you want to you want you also want to deconstruct them for when it when when it feels like they're just leading to what is ultimately like uh, destructive or in in some other way is it is, is harmful to either the individual or to society or humanity as a whole that's for me where it just becomes more complicated i guess this film is an interesting example of a very individualistic critique of a collectivist society mm -hmm. i think we've we've talked about kind of both sides of that coin on this podcast movies that level a little bit of more of a collectivist critique of individualism and show how everybody is sort of trying to be a tsukumo you can kind of maybe have this breakdown of cohesion or understanding in a way that can make it difficult for everybody to just coexist or have like a common sense of narrative but also you can get into this this area where everybody just falls into line and there's kind of it perpetuates a kind of tyrannical tradition that it doesn't serve the people anymore mm -hmm. this movie ultimately really holds up this guy who decides that what he believes is right is more important than this code that he's being forced to adhere to and he dies for it which is a very universal and profound story that we see in a lot of a lot mm -hmm. of different contexts but i think this this movie in particular is a wonderful example of it yeah i feel like especially after this discussion it feels more timeless than ever yes yeah thank you again to zachary for that wonderful suggestion and again if you want to join our patreon community you can go to patreon.com slash cinema of meaning thank you all for listening you can also check us out on nebula where you can get access to bonus episodes that we have available and you can listen to episodes there ad free and a week early the link is always down in the description for how you can join nebula and find us on there and we will catch you next time